Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Dr. Alejandro Fried, and he's here to share with us his new book, Changing Tides, and Ecologist's Journey to Make Peace with the Anthropocene. Now, for over two decades, Alejandro has inhabited the world of science, modern indigenous cultures, and climate activism. As an ecologist for the First Nations of British Columbia Central Coast and adjunct assistant professor in the School of Environmental Studies and the University of Victoria, Alejandro works in collaboration with First Nations on the integration of traditional knowledge and Western science to advance conservation and revitalize indigenous control of their resources. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Alejandro Fried. Thank you. It's great to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. My goodness, I hear it's making huge waves and people are really impressed with the information in this book. Oh, that's uh, awesome to hear. Thank you. Yes, of course. So why don't you share with our listeners the inspiration behind writing this book? Because I know you have another book that's out as well, but what inspired you to write this one? Yeah, so um, I, I, I work as an ecologist, so that gives me constant access to data that doesn't paint uh, a very positive uh, outcome for the future if you look at it in only one way. But um, I realized that um, you know the future has a big range of possibilities that have yet to be realized. And that humans still have a lot of agency, a lot of uh, ability to decide on choosing the better part of that range. Um, As you mentioned, I also have this uh, prior book that talks about, um, you know, I relate to my daughter who at the time I was writing that, that first book, she was very, very young. And I relate to her the state of the world through letters. And through that, I come to terms with the... Uh, this idea that we have a plausible alternative story for what humans are and how our overall industrial civilization can do a much better job of relating to the earth. And I, I failed to expand on that idea in the second book, um, which it, you know uses my experience uh, working at the interface of science and indigenous traditional knowledge in uh, showing examples of how uh, humanity as a whole can uh, can achieve a much better relationship with the planet. Well, you write this book from a very unique perspective, not only as an ecologist, but you know, you talk about this relationship you have with the indigenous nations, and it's because of the work that you've done with them that this book was able to come forward. Yes, the human component of my work is uh, equally, if not more important than the scientific component. Um, so what I do is largely about relationship with the people who are the original inhabitants of um, of the Northwest uh, Coast, um, or specifically British Columbia in, in Western Canada. So these are four indigenous group for, groups for who I work as their science coordinator and ecologist. And uh, together, we look at what concerns them in terms of marine conservation and how an integration of their knowledge from a traditional ecological knowledge perspective can be complemented with science to um, try and make policy changes that are more consistent with uh, their worldviews. And their worldview is so much about uh, living in reciprocity with our non-human relatives, how people are inseparable from biodiversity and have obligations to the broader uh, biodiversity. That's a very fundamental uh, construct in their culture. And the fact that it's not an old story, that it's something that's very present today in our modern world, in it's a living part of this culture, is really what has inspired me to see a better path forward uh, for, for all of us. Well, I love that perspective because when we look at it from how the First Nations are approaching this, I mean, we really do need to have a very proactive approach in how we're managing our and co-living with our resources. 
Yes, and what has really started to change uh, uh, in Canada is that um, uh, the federal government, who's you know up to now has been the dominant uh, force in making decisions about how resources are managed, is uh, partnering in much more meaningful ways with um, First Nations and bringing their knowledge and perspectives into resource management decisions. Um, the last five years, in particular, have been particular uh, have been very um, uh, have shown very positive signs of this being possible. So we, um, for example, we're engaged in the design of a marine protected area network that combines scientific knowledge, but also brings in what's called cultural conservation priorities, which is what the First Nations are bringing. And what that means is it points to areas where they say, well. We may not have scientific data about the importance of these areas, but we have been here for so long that we know that they're very important for these species, and these species are also are part of our traditional foods, and therefore they support our culture. And that's being taken, uh, you know, quite seriously by the federal government in the design of the protected area. So that that is another example of how you know we are in these uh, this change towards something much more positive with how we manage our resources. Well, in your book, you talk about, you know, logging and fisheries, and you mentioned how, you know, that's really affecting, you know, just the environment in general. But you also mentioned how rockfish are kind of a mirror for what we use and what we don't use as some of our best human qualities. And I'd love for you to explain how that, what do you mean by that statement? Yes, you've uh, uh, t- touched on one of my favorite subjects because I absolutely love rockfish. Uh, for those of you uh, listeners who might not be aware of them, so this is a group of uh, marine fish that has a huge diversity of species. But what's really interesting is some of these species uh, live a really long time. I mean, we're talking a century or more. And they reproduce throughout their lifetime once they become sexually mature. And what's really interesting is the older and larger um, uh, one of these females is from one of the longer-lived rockfish species, the more uh, young they produce. So you really, if you're managing a fishery sustainably, it's really important to keep those uh, really fecund, large, old females in the population. And um, one of the... um, Examples I use in the book to show how traditional practices from indigenous people uh, were aware of this, the need for this, and uh, and what became part of how they managed their fishery is that uh, is the example of how uh, if you look at the archaeological record, uh, the species of rockfish that were targeted over many millennia. Um, in this particular study I described, it's over 2,500 years. They were targeting primarily the shorter-lived species of rockfish that can take fishery uh, exploitation um, better than the longer-lived species. And the reason why that's possible is the shorter-lived species tend to live more in the water column. Uh, They're more, uh, you know, off the bottom, uh, closer to the surface in many cases. Well, they're really long species that you know you you know you don't want to remove the larger older fish are at the bottom. So so um, by uh, using their fishing gear only mid water, they were were able to selectively target the more sustainable the, uh, the the species that can take fishery exploitation more sustainably. And this is shown in the archaeological record. Uh, without that kind of um, uh, practice, they would have depleted rockfish populations centuries ago. Uh, but they chose not to do that. They had very large population densities, the original inhabitants of of the of British Columbia, and uh, they had very sophisticated technologies. So it really required intentionality to not overexploit um, rockfish, and uh, they are so sensitive uh, to exploitation uh, that I that's why I call them a mirror for um, the human capacity to conserve or not. I love that story because it's so amazing when you look at that, just the longevity of the fish itself and the awareness that goes into like, what are we doing for the environment? Is this uh, the best thing that we could be doing or should we look at, you know, maybe 
if they're, if we're looking at harvesting some of the younger fish, do that, you know, so it's, it's very interesting how that all comes together. And, and just to give you a little bit of contrast, um, you know, in, um, when modern fisheries, uh, for, for rockfish began to expand in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, they immediately started removing all the large, older fish from the long-lived species and basically collapsed a lot of these stocks within a period of about 20 years. Uh, and right now, uh, I mean, basically in about 20 years, they done did millennia of sustainability. So now we're... Uh, you know, in the aftermath of that, we're trying to work together um, in, to rebuild those uh, populations. That's just astounding. My goodness. I know in your book, you talk about how, you know, humans, we have really excelled in our capacity to be this geological force. And I'd love for you to kind of dive into that for our listeners and what you mean by that. Yes. So, um, so uh, as uh, industrial civilization um, developed, um, we, we as we started changing not only the atmosphere as much as most listeners are aware of, we have raised the CO two level in the atmosphere to the point that uh, it's uh, been changing our climate. But also we've altered the the the, the composition of the rocks of the Earth's structure, the geology of the Earth. And one example I use is uh, that of that of um, fossil uh, fossils that are half a billion year old, and they are of trilobites. And uh, when a, a geologists studied those fossils, they were looking for chemical markers that um, might uh, give them clues about the past environments in which the trilobites lived um, half a billion years ago. But instead, they found that most of the chemical markers in them reflected uh, modern synthetic compounds that were derived mostly from petroleum. Uh, so, you know, that basically tells us that within the last hundred years, we've completely altered, uh, you know, the composition of of, uh, of the Earth's structure. And, um, and that's what... Uh, uh, what defines the Anthropocene, which is the new geologic era that we're entering. But the one thing that I really need to emphasize is that this is not humans in general that were a geologic force that caused it. It was a certain type of uh, human uh, worldview uh, coupled with certain human technologies that led to that. Now, there's nothing ingrained about us humans that determine that that assess we must do this we must be a geologic force um and and that's where i bring the contrast of this alternative way that humans can be um that's reflected in the indigenous cultures that i work with uh the choice to uh conserve is very much there for all of us and sure we have changed the world irrevocably but uh through you know, through our uh, the industrial activities we've already had, but there's still many uh, possibilities for what the future is, and uh, we can aim for a much better part of the of that future if we start changing the story of uh, how humans um, can relate to the Earth, not being a geologic force, but uh, being a society that believes in uh, the responsibilities to to biodiversity at large and integrating that into how we manage resources more broadly, and also just how, as individuals, we um, perceive our, our role in, in, in the world. Yeah. I was really surprised when I read in your book that there are only currently 5% of the global population was Indigenous people. And it was kind of heartbreaking to read that because, I mean, it's the Indigenous people are teaching us and remind us so much about you know, that connection, that deep connection with the planet and the animals on it, you know, and how to coexist. Yes, that certainly uh, colonization had a, an impact that is in many ways analogous to that of, um, you know, that fossil fuels have had on the atmosphere, a very dramatic change. But the really key thing is that we still have uh, these indigenous groups uh, present and there are revitalizing much of their knowledge, much of their uh, governance practices, um, 
in in a way that is starting to have influences in, in places like Canada. So there is, we are in this period of um, rebuilding. Well, that's good to hear, you know, so it's not all doom and gloom because I know a lot of times people can feel very um, like we're just not progressing enough, you know, as a civilization in order to make changes that we need to make to um, not get into this like extinction event where you hear a lot of people talking about that nowadays. Yeah, and and that's um, largely why um, I felt the book was so necessary because um, if if you pay attention only to some of the downward trends, it's very easy to fall into some kind of a self fulfilled prophecy that um, you know that tells you yes, humans are destructive. There's nothing to be done about that. And again, it's a reminder of humans have been. And but it's not humans in general. Certain human cultures coupled with certain technologies. Uh, now that if we spread awareness of this broadly, uh, and and take away that self-fulfilled doom and gloom aspect of how we see ourselves, and create a new story about what humans can be, and and it's not a story that we're starting from scratch. It's a story that's reflected on on uh, on the you know these indigenous cultures that I'm lucky to be working with. And others as well in other parts, other parts of the world. I'm sure because you have this rare view into just how this all comes together. When you were, when you've been doing your research, not just for this book, but just you know during your your life, you know, doing what you do, was there something that kind of really hit home for you that most people don't hear about? Well, you know, one example that. Um, you know, in a way, it's a simple example, but really encapsulates um, uh, the attitude uh, that's inherent to these cultures. Is um, one time I was out um, uh, studying the the fishery for um, for halibut, which uh, the, the traditional fishery. So I was um, on a boat with um, with a person called Charlie Mason, and he's a very important hereditary chief of the Kitasuhehe's First Nation. And he's an extremely generous person. I mean, once he realizes that you have an open heart uh, and, and an open mind, he he just loves sharing his story and his knowledge. So I, I was spending all day with him uh, setting up long lines to uh, fish for halibut. And uh, so Charlie is known as one of the people uh, who, who provides traditional food to, to his community. So he's not just fishing for himself, but he's fishing to... Uh, bring back uh, traditional foods and distribute it um, to everybody in his community. And so we set up a long line and, uh, you know, when later on we're picking it up and um, I'm pulling it up and you know, we don't have a hauler. It's in a really small boat. It's raining like crazy. It's not much above freezing. And, um, and uh, you know, we've held better coming in and he says, okay, young man, step aside. And, um, and I'm like, Charlie, I'm a little younger than you. I'm looking at this 70 plus year old man telling me to give him the line so he can haul it up. And he said, I'm a, I may be an important hereditary chief, but I'm not a king. So I step over and I was like, okay, I, I, I can go with that. And then uh, later after we had hauled about 50 halibut, he tells me that um, one of his um, uncles had told, had taught him in the past that if he made an infusion from devil's club bark and devil's clubs uh, an important uh, plant of the rainforest in that part of the world and he soaked the uh, fishing gear in devil's club um, then he would have a much higher catch rate and that the last time that he did that uh, instead of he basically got about three times more halibut than we had that time and i'm like charlie how come we're not doing that now and he said well if you do that we get way more than what we need. And that simple statement, like, you know, the, that you, he did not want to get more than what was required is so reflective of these cultures. And uh, that very simple lesson uh, is what needs to pervade our broader society, taking what we need, focusing on what's left behind rather than how much we can take. And uh, that really solidified to me uh, and, uh, you know, that alternative plausible story of what humans can be. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, what a deep respect for the planet and the, you know, the creatures that we are 
um, here with. When we look at this, I mean, is there a way that we can become more mindful, respectful of, of Indigenous laws or belief systems so that we can be more in alignment with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, and I've been giving it some thought how people in different parts of the world might, might be able to do that. So with the book, what I'm doing right now is raising awareness that these indigenous laws exist um, in in um, you know the part of the world that I work in, but but uh, there certainly are parallel uh, traditions in many other parts of the world. So so really, the place to start is to create a dialogue with um, the indigenous peoples that are in in the part of the world that you live. Uh, at this stage, it might not be obvious how. But a lot of these people are writers um, that, you know, are putting out their own perspective. Robin Wall Kimmerer is uh, an example of uh, of an indigenous writer who I think has uh, been very influential in beginning to um, um, bring, uh, you know, parts of this alternative story about how humans can relate to the earth. Uh, so starting with, you know, reading this, these writers is, um, I think, really important. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see, uh, curriculums everywhere in schools, uh, begin to bring, um, you know, very, me- you know, much more meaning- meaningful, um, uh, 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 teachings of, of the history of indigenous peoples and, um, uh, and in, in their respective parts of the world and how, how these, cultures are persisting in the modern context. Ideally, this would happen with uh, uh, indigenous peoples themselves being the designers of the courses and, and the teachers. Uh, so we're, we're not at a stage yet in which, you know, uh, there's an easy follow-up because these are the changing times. I mean, this is a time of raising the, the awareness and uh, hopefully as the awareness raises, uh, uh, then... Um, uh, more specific ways in which individuals can follow up will start emerging. Yeah, I agree with you. It seems like we need greater dialogue and, and definitely awareness initially, but then greater dialogue on how we can be more respectful to the planet and the creatures that we cohabitate this planet with. Um, because, you know, one system declines, all systems decline. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I mean, and there's many books out there that, talk about how if you, you know, eat less meat, you bring down your impact um, on on the atmosphere, on the earth, and, you know, about the value of uh, switching to renewable energies. And uh, I did not want to duplicate any of that in this book, because I think there's enough resources out there for people to access on that, on the, on the more prescriptive stuff. I wanted to... Um, uh, you know, talk about the big picture, about the big human story of where we have come from and where we can go. And um, so, so be- raising awareness of that alternative story and uh, is, is really my main objective with this book. What are some of the deeper lessons that you want readers to take away from your book? I think that the most important one is that uh, we still have quite a range of possibilities for the future. And, and if, we, if we start uh, behaving differently, we can end up in the better part of that range, but we do not have much time. Uh, in terms of uh, switching out of our fossil fuel economy into one that doesn't uh, keep altering the atmosphere, we're, you know, ideally we're doing this in 10 years or less. Uh, less is doing it sooner is much better than later. Um, for that to happen, uh, we need a big change in the, in the, in our political leadership and, you know, people in democracies elect their leaders. So, uh, I'm hoping that in raising the awareness for the issues that I'm, that I talk about in the book, some people will become more inspired uh, to become politically active and choose those, um, you know, uh, other uh, leaders that they can see the need to um, shift our economies in, in ways that are much more sustainable. Um, and, and so, 
and the other one is, um, as we've been talking about, is becoming aware if you're of who are the original peoples of 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 the land where you live are, and uh, looking at the possibilities of um, dialogue with them. Well, it's interesting because when we look at, and I learned this from your book, so correct me if I get this wrong, but if we look at the ecological resilience of some species and how that interplays with indigenous cultures, you know, it, they're both hand in hand. So if we have one that is not as resilient, we, you know, we talk about the, basically about the rockfish, if something happens and that economy, that ecological system falls, then what happens to our indigenous cultures as well? That's right. Um, but uh, so, so resilience is something that's inherent to, um, to these cultures as well. And, and what, I mean, what I mean by that is if, if, say, the rockfish were to disappear, it would be a terrible shock. Uh, it's a very important traditional food, uh, and, and there would be a big loss. But uh, they have other important traditional foods. Now, it doesn't mean that rockfish are expendable. But uh, while suffering the loss, they would still have other foods like herring and Dungeness crab, salmon, that uh, are important to them. But uh, I do want to uh, use this as a segue into the broader topic of ecological resilience, which is um, very much part of the book. And uh, so to... Let me use the metaphor of a bowl inside a cup to describe ecological resilience. So the cup is the range of shocks that an ecosystem can take. And by shocks, I mean climate warming, uh, logging, fisheries. And then there's the bowl inside the cup that is the state of the ecosystem at any one point. So if it's at the bottom, it's where it's this, the ecosystem is most stable. But that rarely happens. Uh, most of the time, um, you know, there's fire or, you know, after humans came into the picture, there's logging and the ball is getting thrown all over inside the cup, getting near the edge. But as long as the, sh the range of shocks doesn't push it out of the cup, the ecosystem maintains its overall integrity. What we're trying to avoid is to have that ball be thrown out of the cup and land into something completely different from which the ecosystem does not recover. That is um, ecological resilience, staying within the cup. And, and that's largely where I see our future lies. It's in, uh, not, you know, it's in managing the combination of stressors that we can so that that's that ball that describes the state of the ecosystem doesn't get thrown out of the cup. And one concrete example of that is, um, is if you know, we have uh, fisheries and we have ocean warming affecting many species, including rockfish. At this stage, there's so much momentum in the climate system that the warming will continue for a long, long time. Um, but so it's hard to do something uh, specific about that. Uh, what we can start controlling right now is is uh, protecting uh, certain populations from any fisheries and those that do get fished, doing it much more conservatively, and that reduces the combined synergistic effects of um, ocean warming and fisheries and gives gives the chance for the the that bowl that defines the state of the, that fish uh, community to stay within the cup. Um, in, and this applies also to indigenous cultures. I mean, if we, you know, something, you know, very uh, sad, like the loss of rockfish was to happen, uh, I think that would push that bowl that describes the state of indigenous cultures closer towards the edge of the cup. But that, so in that case, uh, we really have to focus on maintaining the other traditional foods available so that because if all the traditional foods get lost, then they might, um, you know, they might start losing resilience and from a cultural perspective. Well, I'm so glad that you elaborated on that and added to that because, I mean, I think it's such a, uh, a discussion that we need to have now and look at what we can do to make impactful changes today. And of course, picking up a copy of Changing Tides is a place to start. Alejandra, where can people connect with you and learn more about your books and become part of your community? 
Um, well, I, I have a website that describes some of my research. Um, it, the best way to find it is to search for my name, um, and uh, that will give people examples of some of the research I, I do. Um, and, and otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the book should be available through your uh, local independent bookstores. Um, it's available for the publisher, New Society Publishers. And, um, yeah, they have it everywhere you know, that books are sold. Well, Alejandro, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Well, Alejandro, it's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Changing Tides. Changing Tides is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. If not me, then who? This ethos is driving the Travis Manion Foundation to empower veterans and families of fallen heroes to develop character in future generations. In 2007, Marine First Lieutenant Travis Manion was killed in Iraq while saving his wounded teammates. Travis's legacy lives on in the five words he spoke before leaving for his final deployment. If not me, then who? Guided by this mantra, veterans continue their service, developing strong relationships in the community and thrive in their post-military lives. Visit TravisManion.org and ensure the character of our nation's heroes lives on in the next generation. If not me, then who? Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. You know, today's show is all about the earth and the impact we make on it. I am so excited to be introducing our next special guest today. So Mary McNerney is here today to share with us her new book, Earth Speaks Up, Dynamic New Perspective on Earth and Your Role Here. Now, Mary earned her law degree from Georgetown University and had a fellowship with the UN Commission on International Trade Law, and then worked many years as a corporate and international lawyer in Boston and Prague. It was not her plan to write this book, and she never imagined that the spirit of the earth would one day clearly and shockingly speak to her. So let's welcome to the show, Mary McNerney. Marianne, it's great to be here with you and to have the opportunity to share the wonderful information in this book with you and, and your listeners. So I'm just so pleased to be able to, to talk about it with you all. Yeah, you know, what an honor it is to spend this time with you. I felt like your book was groundbreaking when it comes to how to connect and our perspective with the earth. And I have to ask you, what inspired you to write this book? 
Well, I have to tell you, Marianne, writing this book was not on my radar screen at all. Um, I was, um, I guess I was always connected to nature. I grew up on a farm in Ohio, a wonderful farm, but I followed the traditional path most of us do, going off to college and then I went on to law school and um, had a long career uh, as a corporate lawyer in, in Boston and in Prague. Um, you know, pretty well ensconced in paperwork and um, what is it, left brain? Is that our logic, rational mind, our logical, rational way of operating in the world? Um, doing contracts and um, managing business and, uh, logistics and negotiations. So that was my um, my life at the time until one day I was home from work and it was a beautiful day out and I was enjoying um the idea of um, having this free time to do what as I please. And I I was looking out the window at this beautiful day and thinking, um, what shall I do today? I think grabbing my husband and our dog and going for a walk in the woods or getting my horse out to ride on the trails. And I just happened to say kind of aloud to to no one in particular, because I was the only one in the room. I just said aloud to myself, hmm, what shall I do today? And then, Marianne, I heard these words profoundly and distinctly, take dictation from the earth. And I knew right away it was the angelic realm. There was no one else in the room, and it was clearly it was the angelic realm speaking. And I was taken aback initially, and I thought, that's a really profound idea, but um, certainly meant for the more illustrious spiritual people of our time. Um, Not for me. I'm a corporate lawyer. And um, so I tabled the idea, I put it in the back of my mind, and then eventually forgot about it until uh, six months later, I heard the exact same thing, take dictation from the earth. And so this time I thought I would give it a try. I had no idea what to do or what I was supposed to do, but I took a pen and paper in hand and went out and sat on the edge of the woods in our backyard and just sat there. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, the dictation started coming. And initially, it was hard for my my hand and my mind to keep up with, with the words because uh, we're working on we're working on a different frequency when we when we connect with the angelic realm, and um, and this was all new to me. And as the and so the dictation came that day, and I continued doing it over the ensuing months and years. And that's what this book, that what came forth was this book. And it was clear to me from the outset they were dictating a book to me. And the they was our planet Earth, uh, who is a conscious, sentient, and communicating being, eager to engage with, with each one of us. And also the speakers were... Um, from the angelic realm also who came in in support of earth communication with us And these um, speakers came across to me as, as a group of like very wise, um, serious professors. Um, that's the, the, the tone, the sense I had when they spoke. So it was a, a communication from the earth and from the angelic realm supporting the earth bringing forth information for us, for humanity, on how we need to learn to see Earth in a new way and how we need to begin to recognize what our own individual role is here. So that's in a nutshell um, how it came forth for, for me. And I like sharing that story because I realized this is this is an innate capability we all have. It's not just me. I'm no I'm no special nature guru. Uh, it was just shown to me that this is an innate ability we all have, and we all can begin listening and attuning to Earth in this way and working together with her in an amazing new way on the energetic level. How beautiful is that? Mm-hmm. Now, before that happened, had you heard from the angelic realm before? Um, I was, I guess I was attuned to that. I grew up in a family who was um, very aware of the multidimensional 
reality of our world um, and who is aware of um, the nature spirits around us and the angelic realm around us. But I'd never connected with the earth in this way or taken dictation in this way. Um, I had a general awareness and openness to the angelic realm, but hadn't, hadn't um, encountered it in this deep and an expansive way. Um, but then so again, exciting. I was shown this yeah. is something we all are being asked to awaken to, and we all are able to do this. We've just become sort of separated from our ability to divorce from it by humanity's gotten sort of distracted by our material world and forgotten or neglected our connection to the angelic realm and to the real multidimensional world we live in. And we've totally forgotten that, that earth is, a living, communicating being. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and when you talk about the earth being a living, communicating being, why don't you share a little bit for our listeners what she is like? Well, when the earth came across to me, it's like a, a very loving presence. And I was amazed at the and also came across as as a feminine being, a feminine sense, a feminine tone is what came across to me. And now I understand why throughout the ages Earth has been referred to as Mother Earth because there does there is a feminine quality to um, the essence that she is, and the essence that she shares, and a loving presence that. It was really needing humanity to step up and to recognize what our role with her is. Um, we are here as caretakers of the earth and to share with earth and to work together with earth and to co-create with earth. And we've kind of um, lost our way in really understanding what our role is. And so this book was brought forth to help us as individuals get back on track and recognize the real purpose of our life here isn't necessarily climbing the corporate ladder or achieving this or that or doing, doing, doing. It's about being here in conscious connection with the earth and um, engaging with her in a new way. And it doesn't mean we have to separate ourselves from our daily existence. We just need to expand our, our um, interactions, our daily interactions with the world to spend a little time here and there connecting with the earth as a communicating being. Um, you don't need, I eventually had left the corporate world because this became really my purpose now, um, writing this book and sharing it with the world. But this book is something that anyone can in the information here, anyone can incorporate easily into their daily life. It doesn't mean you have to leave your career track or whatever else you're, you're engaged with in your daily life. It just means it's just an opportunity to share and expand, share in the, share in being in the world in a new way and expand the way you're interacting with the planet, which benefits her and benefits each one of us. To it's a real togetherness we can bring into our lives with the planet. Well, in your book, you talk about humanity's role. So, what is humanity's role with the planet, and what are some of the changes that we could make to make our existence together better? Well, I could see there's humanity's role is much more expansive than what we realize, and humanity needs to step up and begin working on the energetic level with Earth. And the ener- as we know, thought precedes form. Thought is the creative energetic level that then brings forth the physical world. And this book gives us the wisdom and guidance and tools to help us learn to delve into a new relationship with Earth and to begin working and healing with her on this way. It gives nine simple exercises we can each kind of spend a few minutes a day doing that benefit Earth and benefit ourselves. And I'd like to to step back and look at it a little more expansively. I see now in our world, 
with so much of our energy or a lot of energy around what is going into the climate justice movement and activists and protests and and uh, rallies against climate change and and um, protests to get somebody to do something, get big government to do something about climate change, get corporations or scientists to do something to help the planet um, with these circumstances we're in now with climate change. And we have a lot of um, protest energy and fight energy trying to push somebody, the government, somebody to do something. And we all kind of feel like, well, um, just, I'm just a little individual. There's nothing I myself can do. Hey, I recycle. I, um, uh, I try and conserve electricity. I ride my bike when I can instead of the car, whatever. That's all I can do. We all feel there's nothing more we as individuals can do. But the fact of the matter is there's a heck of a lot we can do individually. We just need to see there's another path. Beyond, instead of the protest and the fight energy, there's a path where we can follow to bring forth our creative energy in a positive way to engage with Earth and work together with Earth in the co-creative way that's, that's set, set forth for us in this book that Earth and the angelic realm are showing us in this book, and it's a whole new direction to begin to attune to earth um, energetically and um, and then simple exercises to begin to be able to work with earth on the energetic level, which nourishes her and helps bring her into balance and in so doing helps bring us into balance. Because the whole, my sense is the whole climate issue that's arising now and that we're faced with now is because the planet's been pushed out of balance largely by human activity and it's gotten to the point she can't do it alone anymore. She needs us to join together with her to help bring about the healing and the balance that is needed for the planet and for ourselves. And so the earth is giving us this guidebook, Earth Speaks Up, to show us, hey, here's the way you can join together with me. Here's the way you can join together with me in a loving, creative way. And I so, the sense I get from her is that she so loves humanity and so loves all of nature, everything that's created and brought forth through her body, uh, and that and she needs and wants so much to communicate with us and engage with us in a new way and show us, hey, I'm here. Connect with me. Work together with me. And here's the pathway to help you do that, to help you join up with me. And so this book is like a wonderful gift to each one of us. It really is. It's at this perfect time where I think, and you talk about this, where it, it seems that humanity is on the cusp of, of having an expansion in their mindset and our role with this planet. You know, we have young children now that just are coming in ready for this new, new mindset and this new change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I agree totally with that, Marianne, young children coming in ready for this new mindset. But you know what? The fact of the matter is, we are all here now and we are all ready for this new mindset. That's why we're here now because we're all ready for this. And, um, and the earth is offering this pathway to all of us. It's not like the young children coming in now have any more special gifts than the rest of us. We all have it. It's just gotten kind of, um, tamped down in our system, our innate ability to connect with the angelic realm and to attune to earth and to connect with the living essence, which is all of nature around us. We came in with that. We all came in with that, but kind of through our educational system and the way our world is now, we get separated from that ability that got lost and suppressed and forgotten, but we all have it. It just needs to be reawakened 
And once we start working with it, kind of the doors open and it flows and it becomes much easier for us to engage with earth and engage with nature and the angels in this way. So it's not, it's not something special that others have. It's something special we each have. We just need to remember to and learn to step into it, to use it, to develop this ability, to work with it. And once we start to work with it, simply by doing the easy exercises in the book, it opens so many doors for us to really enrich ourselves and to enrich our planet in a wonderful new way. So I just um, am so eager to be able to share the information in this book with with your listeners and everyone beyond because it's it can change so much for ourselves and our planet and bring so much enrichment and joy and an unfolding of so much of our own potential, our own potential as humans. Um, I feel this book that was given to us um, will open us all up as well as our planet to a wonderful and profound deepening of our relationship and a wonderful and profound healing of ourselves and our, and our planet earth. Mm, That's so beautiful. And for our listeners that are wanting to make this change and create this new relationship, do they do the same thing that you did, which is basically sit in nature and listen? Well, no, it's actually much easier than what I did, you know, <laughs> because because I didn't have a guidebook showing me what to do. I was like, what? I What the heck am I doing? Um, but this book makes it much easier. And the and um, the, sim- the simple exercises that kind of show us how to attune, how to settle, how to listen. And, um, and, and the interesting thing is, Marianne, is that we don't have to do this out in nature. You can do it anywhere. You can do it sitting on the couch at your house. You can do it in your office. You can do it where, in your car when you're, when you're way, stuck in traffic. It doesn't matter. You can do it anywhere because Earth's energetic field and Earth's consciousness is so expansive. I mean, it's huge that we can connect and engage with her anywhere. It might be easier for us individually as we start to kind of go and settle in and sit on the, sit on the, you know, out in nature, sit under a tree. That might be easier for us as individuals to start that way, but that's not a prerequisite at all because earth consciousness is ready to engage with us from wherever we are. It's so expansive. Yeah, yeah, and that's so encouraging because you get some people that maybe live in a concrete jungle and they don't mm-hmm. have a whole lot of nature around. So being able to have that connection doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be out hugging a tree. Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Because Earth's presence, Earth's consciousness is everywhere. And you think of Earth's um, atmosphere, her, which is her energetic field, is like, I don't know, miles, goes for miles beyond the Earth. So, yeah, you can be in a skyscraper building in the m- middle of New York City and still easily connect with Earth. Um, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, and Earth is really ready to engage with you now. And the wonderful thing is, once we each start connecting with her in, in this way and doing these simple exercises, it has a ripple effect. Um, the positive change we create moves beyond us individually because when you're working on the energetic level, it's much more fluid and powerful than when we work on our little three-dimensional physical plane. Um, so this engaging in these exercises with Earth, even though it's only me doing it or you doing it or a few of us doing it, it has an effect beyond ourselves. And that's the wonderful thing. Um, we can we can make a difference. We individually can make a difference. Um, we don't have to put our energy into taking the bus down to protest in Washington, D.C. for a climate justice rally. Yeah, that's great to do, but something even more powerful is to start engaging with Earth on the energetic level and attuning to Earth um, and not restricting ourselves to just doing things on the, in our physical level. 
Yeah, without a doubt. You mentioned earlier that, you know, it, it, this is, there's many like, you know, ancient connections and things that we've forgotten when it comes to our communication with the earth, you know, tomorrow, and I'm so glad we're having this discussion today because tomorrow's winter solstice, you know, it's December 21st. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we use the solstice to benefit our communication and our working relationship and our new relationship with the earth? Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Marianne, that with the solstice coming up, because in the book, um, there's a, a chapter and that they do a, a, a earth and the angelic realm speak to us about the importance of the solstice, these solstice times. And it's a great time to begin your work together with earth on the solstice, because when we connect and attune to the earth on the solstice and also um, the solstice energy it is um, clear and open for three days before that moment of solstice and three days after. So that whole window there is a very powerful time for us to connect and engage with Earth at the solstice time and to set forth um, our vibrations, our positive vibrations for the planet. Because... Um, because of the nature of the cosmic connection and what's going on with the cosmos at this time of solstice and with the earth, there becomes a, I guess I'd say a more expansive channel for um, the positive energy we may put forth to be taken up and given forth, brought forth into creation, into the earth and into the cosmos. It's a really unique and powerful time to us for us to work um, on the energetic level with us, on the positive level, on the loving level, on the engaging level, and maybe at this solstice um, to set forth our intention, just to even say to earth, you don't even really have to be feeling any connection, but to bring your attention into earth, to feel your energy sink into earth and your attention and your energy sink into her and to say, earth, I'm here. I hear you. I am stepping up to engage with you and work together with you. And when you simply bring your attention forth in that way, especially at Solstice, it will bring, create a positive vibration um, going from you to the earth. And then even if you um, have the book and can in, and do one of the simple exercises. The exercises they give, you can even do for five minutes. It doesn't require, a, you know, a big time commitment. Um, but in, the more you do it, like anything, the better, the more effective it is. But to do some of these exercises at Solstice or to, if you don't have the book now, just bring your intent into earth in this loving way. It, bring your attention, your attunement to her because she'll feel it. And she'll recognize, oh, humanity is hearing me. Humanity is desiring to engage with me. And at Solstice, I, I know it'll have a wonderful ripple effect. So I'm glad you brought that up, Marianne, about the importance of Solstice. And the thing is, you know, ancient societies knew this and worked with Earth very consciously at the time of Solstice. It was a special time where they engaged with Earth. And our modern society has forgotten that. And we're now, again being asked to remember, step back into your role, step back into your role as caretakers and co-creators with planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. I mean, it seems that there's this reawakening to this ancient knowledge where before maybe, you know, um, we've just got so industrialized that we forgot this deep, you know, loving connection that the planet has with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. We've just gotten distracted by the material world. The material world is great and fun and nothing wrong with our three-dimensional material world. But we've kind of divorced ourselves from the other aspect of our world, which is this multidimensional and this consciousness, which is Earth. It's sort of like now I see it where the way we are with Earth is sort of like these two strangers passing in the night, you know, it's like where we are now, it's you're walking down the sidewalk and you, and you pass a, a stranger coming the other way. You're aware of them, but there's no connection. There's no engagement. You just walk on by. 
but then um, then further down the sidewalk, maybe you encounter you happen to encounter a dear old friend, someone you hadn't seen in a while or engaged with in a while, and you're so happy to see each other, and you hug and you embrace and you talk and you engage, and there's a sharing of emotion and vibration and energy, and it's just wonderful. And so you and then even though you two may continue on your separate ways down the sidewalk, you, this wonderful engagement you've shared has fed and buoyed you both throughout your day. And that's sort of like a parallel I see between the way we are with earth now is like this passing the stranger. We're aware of each other, but we don't engage. But where we need to go is to realize, I have a relationship with this being same way as this, my dear old friend I passed on the sidewalk. I have a relationship. I need to engage. I need to share the emotion and vibration and the consciousness of who I am with who planet earth is. And that's where our, I think this book, Earth Speaks Up, is brought to us to show us, hey, how we transform our relationship from these two strangers passing on the sidewalk to these dear old friends that haven't connected in a while and really need to connect and share with each other. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's, and it's interesting, too, because in your book, you talk about the sacred feminine. And, it, and you look at just the changes that have been happening you know, with even within the last year, you know, within society, how the feminine is actually coming more, becoming more of a stronger presence. What is that balance between the earth and the sacred feminine? And how does that relate to us? Oh, that's a, that's a really broad question. And I feel like, and also I would say, man, I don't have all the answers to all the questions that that come up for myself or for all of us, you know, because I'm still exploring this the way, all the rest of us are. I'm just maybe a little bit ahead because I've, I've started with this book. Um, but it's all something that's unfolding for us. And there's a chapter in here about earth and the sacred feminine. And, um, it, it sort of explains to us how, um, for a long time, we as society got divorced from our sacred feminine and separated from our sacred feminine and suppressed the feminine essence of who we all are, who our world is. And I'm not just saying if you're women or men, we all have that within ourselves. We all have like the yin yang, the balance of the feminine masculine and the yin or yang um, energies. But the feminine essence of ourselves and of our society was suppressed and came out of balance. And that had a corollary to, I probably started occurring at the same time, we separated ourselves from recognizing the sacredness um, and majesty and essence of our planet. We suppressed it, um, the divine feminine, the sacred feminine of who our planet is, as we suppressed the feminine essence of our society and ourselves. And all of this now is is coming forth into awakening um, as our as we step into recognizing and creating a balance and equality between um, the masculine and feminine in our society, and um, we're also it's probably all tied into um, recognizing um, and honoring the sacred feminine, which is our planet too. Um, and so I think it's probably. You know, all one and the same. Society's being asked to um, is is co- recognizing, hey, there's something we've been neglecting and suppressing, the feminine aspect of society, the feminine aspect of and creative aspect of ourselves, which is what is the feminine, but the real creative energy of ourselves. We've neglected and suppressed that in society and ourselves, and at the same time, it's a corollary to how we've neglected um, and disregarded the essence of who our planet is. And now it's all being brought, being asked to come forth and see everything in a new way, our society and our planet and ourselves. Yeah. This mm-hmm. time really is begging for us to make these needed changes, you know, mm-hmm. and, and many people realize that it's like, you can't get, you know, these one use, you know, plastic bags and throw them away and they take a thousand years to, you know, disintegrate in the landfill and then they make the area toxic. So we have mm-hmm. to look at what it is that we do and how it affects not just today or tomorrow, but, you know, for generations to come, what our, what our impact is. 
Yeah, exactly. And it's like we have to do exactly that on the practical daily level, um, the the paying attention, they're, they're making changes on that level with the plastics and the recycling. We have to change, as you said, what we do on a daily level with with the pollutants and the toxins and the plastics that we're, you know, trashing the planet with. We have to take charge of that and take responsibility for that and step up and make changes there. But at the, that's not the entirety of it. We have to do that and we have to also begin working in this other way. They both go hand in hand. To do one without the other is not stepping into our full role. We need to be caretakers of the earth on the physical realm and and deal with these things like the toxins and the plastics and and planting more trees and caring more um, fully for nature. We need to do that in, the, in our physical world, but we that's only half of it. We really need to begin to engage on the energetic level and engaging on the energetic level and co-creating with earth on the earth on the energetic level will then support and facilitate the changes that we need to make and the healing we need to bring about on the physical level. Yeah, how important is that? My goodness, you know, your book, Earth Speaks Up, has so much great information. I absolutely love this book. Where can our listeners connect with you and become part of your community? Um, well, I love to connect with people. I have a website, marymcnerney.com. It's Mary, and I'll spell my last name for you, M-C-N as in Nancy, E-R-N-E-Y. And I really enjoy connecting with and engaging with people through the website. And um, and I've been really pleased because so far we've had a good reception. Um, the first month it was out, the book was... Uh, a bestseller on Amazon US and Amazon UK. So I was really pleased that the world is is responding and taking this up. And I re- look forward to engaging with more people and communicating and sharing more and um, hearing their experiences as they work with the exercises in this book or have questions and would like to engage with me further about it. Well, Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thank you, Marianne. It's been a real treat to be able to share this with you and your listeners. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, Mary. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Earth Speaks Up. Earth Speaks Up is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and select indie retailers. If you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. Again, if you'd like to connect with Mary, you can at marymcnerney.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Mary Ann. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.